we follow the story of a man named Bichir Van Baskerville. He was known as the Hound of the Baskerville Clan, a hunting dog that was loyal to his clan and his father. However, the reward for spending all of his life as a loyal dog was his demise. He was falsely accused of colluding with demons and thus cut down by the blade of the guillotine. In his final moments, he swore to himself that if by a miracle, he had another chance at life, he would never live the life of a hunting dog that's killed after the rabbit hunt is over. In the grand mansion of the Baskerville clan, in a room well lit by the moonlight, many cradles with crying babies inside were lined up on both sides. A baby among them suddenly opened his eyes wide, flabbergasted about where he was. It was Biscuit, who had turned into a baby, but he hadn't realized it yet. He could feel how heavy his body was, as well as the unbearable noise around him and could only wonder if he was in hell. A man with short gray hair and an unpleasant face walked between the rows of cradles, remarking that all the kids in this batch seemed to be useless and trash. His name was Hugo Le Baskerville, and he was the current head of the Baskerville clan. While walking, Hugo caught sight of one baby that wasn't crying like the rest and said that at least one of them didn't seem to be completely useless. Hugo ordered his men to move the babies to the cradle of swords and walked away. All this while, Bitcher had not taken his eyes that were burning with hatred off Hugo. Looking at the clan head, his father, and most importantly of all, the main culprit behind the false accusations that got him executed, he was finally certain of his current situation. He had regressed to when he was just a newborn baby. Born as an illegitimate child of the clan, he was trained harshly in his previous life to become a hunting hound for the clan. As a loyal hound dedicated to his mission, he did all sorts of dirty deeds such as assassination, espionage, and blackmail, all for the sake of turning the Baskerville clan into the greatest of the seven clans. The only thing he desired in return was acknowledgement by Hugo Le Baskerville and the Baskerville clan. However, after the long ten-year war against the demons ended and the humans' victory, the only reward he received was execution. Bitcher thought to himself, with clenched hands, the only reason I was executed was because I ended up learning too much. Bitcher swore he would not live such a crummy life again. He wanted to seek vengeance right then and there for all his suffering, but being a newborn, he was powerless to do so. He hardened his resolve and decided to focus on becoming stronger for now. Luckily, he knew the next trial waiting for him was going to be a huge opportunity. Cradle of Swords All the newborns in the Baskerville clan are thrown into a labyrinth of swords and tested on their potential, with the sole goal of the trial being reaching the Styx River. The Styx River is a mythical river that can strengthen a newborn's body and make it as strong as steel. Even though it was a mythical river, there was a limit to how many children could receive the river's effects within a period of time. Bitcher immediately formed a plan in his mind, and decided to head straight through the Wall of Swords to reach there the fastest. As he moved through the Wall of Swords, numerous wounds appeared on his body, but he didn't pay them much attention and continued moving. In his previous life, he couldn't receive the blessing of the Styx River due to his siblings pushing him aside. This time, he planned on monopolizing the river as long as he could. Before long, he arrived at the river, and plunged straight into the water, surprising everyone that was overseeing the trial. As his body submerged deeper into the water, the river water seeped into his body through the open wound, altering even his bones. The pressure of the water suffocated Bichir, making it painful to stay submerged. However, he remained steadfast and tried his best to stay underwater. On the surface, the people of the family started worrying, fearing that the young master would meet his demise. Hugo, on the other hand, showed no concern for the child's safety, and even laughed like a madman. He asked the man standing behind him about how long it had been since Bitcher entered the river. The head butler of the Baskerville clan, John Barrymore, told him that it had been about seven minutes. Hugo casually remarked that staying too long underwater may kill him, and then ordered Bitcher to come out. Bitcher, who was submerged, heard and recognized the call from Hugo, but refused to give up so early. He wanted to absorb as much water as he could, until the very end. He forced himself to hold on, shouting at himself to endure even as he was drowning. Bitcher soon reached his limit. Just as he was about to croak under the pressure, he was pulled out of the river by Hugo. Hugo held the knocked out Bitcher by his leg, looking visibly excited. He remarked how Bitcher had not only plunged into the river sticks, he had also drank it, even growing teeth in the process. Only now did Hugo develop any interest in his own son, and asked the head butler John about the name of the child. Bitcher, who was held upside down, was boiling with rage inside. He planned on quietly sharpening his fangs, and when the right time came, 
he swore to destroy the Baskerville clan with his own hands. Bichir Van Baskerville at the age of eight, the talent he possessed was enough to be called a genius prodigy. However, inside the Baskerville clan, it was only average. At the age of 20, he received missions that were usually assassinations, information gathering or subjugations. At the age of 29, he felt the limits to his swordsmanship and fell behind compared to the top talents of the main house. At the age of 30, a gate appeared in the world that connected the human world and the demon world together, and the invasion of the demons began. At the age of 35, he survived in the massive war between demons and humans and killed countless demons. At the age of 39, the decade-long war finally ended with the victory of humanity. Finally, at the age of 40, he received the reward for his loyalty and efforts in the war, the reward being false accusations and the blade of the guillotine. Bitcher opened his eyes slowly and looked at the slightly familiar ceiling of the nursery. He rolled over in excitement as he realized he had succeeded in absorbing the River Styx's power. Compared to his past life, he would have a much better starting point thanks to this. Just then, a girl came and placed a small chest in Bitcher's cradle before leaving. Bitcher's keen hearing picked up on the girl's complaints about how Madam was going too far by doing something like this. Bitcher was confused as to who Madam was and why would anyone give a gift to an illegitimate child like him. And soon, his suspicions were right on the mark. The chest did not contain any gifts, but rather two bloody mambas slithered out of the chest and hissed at him. Bitcher was surprised, two rare breeds of poisonous snakes just to assassinate a child. The madam was probably trying to reduce competition for her own child. If the snakes were left on their own, all the children in the nursery would be in danger. As expected of Baskerville, thought Bitcher as a grin crept up on his face and his eyes shone with madness. The snakes lunged at him, but before they could reach him, Bitcher caught them both by the head in one swift motion. Just using sheer force, he ripped the two highly poisonous and dangerous snakes apart with his bare hands, leaving the cradle bloodied all over. The next day, the people of Baskerville were horrified when they found a child sleeping with torn corpses of snakes and blood everywhere. An investigation was launched and all the nannies were interrogated, tortured and then executed but the true culprit behind the appearance of the snakes in the nursery was never found. Only one person knew the truth, Bitcher Van Baskerville, the young hunting dog. Time flew and in the blink of an eye, eight years had passed. Bitcher sat in a class with his siblings in Baskerville, learning about the stages of a swordsman. There are four stages to swordsmen's. First stage is a sword beginner. Such swordsmen cannot imbue mana into their swords. Second stage is sword expert. At this level, one can imbue a little amount of mana into their swords. The third stage is sword graduate, who can manifest an aura on their swords. The fourth and the final stage is when one is able to solidify their aura and change its form however they like. Such a level is called sword master. Upon learning that the head of the Baskerville clan, Hugo is at the level of a sword master, the highest possible level. All the students in the class were amazed. All the rest of the students were surprised. Bitcher was busy contemplating. His enemy being at the level of a sword master. He wanted to recover all of his strength before his regression before his coming of age ceremony. Due to his contemplative expression, the instructor teaching the students was impressed. With the body strengthening through the Styx River and an incredible mind, Bitcher's talent was held in high regard by everyone. The instructor thought to himself that the clan head will be elated when he hears of the achievements of young Master Bitcher. However, he was completely oblivious to the sinister thoughts in the eight years old Bitcher's mind as he wondered how many years it would take for him to kill Hugo. Bitcher's remarkable talent caught the attention of many people, and his status as an illegitimate child made many people's baleful eyes, particularly three brothers at the moment. They pulled Bitcher to the side and cornered him, intending to bully him and calling him a half-trash and an illegitimate child. Bitcher recognized them instantly from his previous life. He knew them very well. After all, they were the ones that put the false accusations on him and stabbed him when he was running away. Highbro, Midbro, and Lowbro. They were nicknamed Hugo Le Baskerville's Trident. All three brothers were nine years old and looked completely identical, with only notable differences in their hair. Bitcher thought it may be better to weed them out early before they can become strong. One of the brothers suddenly pulled out a knife and pointed it at him. He said that since Bitcher had been submerged in the Styx River when young, his body should be hard like steel and would not be hurt by blades. He wanted to test it out right now. He called for his brother, who then ran behind Bitcher holding him in place while also covering his mouth. He even made a bet that he would eat his hand if Bitcher could hold out for even three minutes. If Bitcher wanted, he could break free any moment, but he decided to play along. 
he just sighed in his heart, young children really are brutal. None of the three brothers actually expected Bitcher's body to be hard like steel. However, one minute passed, then three minutes passed, and then finally ten whole minutes passed. The three brothers were shocked and terrified as they found out that it was indeed true and real. The brother who had started the whole thing said with a nervous expression that it's not fun and to let Bitcher go. However, before they could do that, Bitcher bit down and tore off a finger of the brother covering his mouth. He screamed, and the others were also shocked, asking him what he was doing. Bitcher, with a crazy blood-filled smile told them that he had bet his hand, and had to keep his words. The brothers tried acting tough by saying they were not scared, but the one who had just lost a finger couldn't keep the facade up. The rest tried to calm him down, and asked him to go to the priest so he could stick the finger back. But just as they were about to leave, Bitcher stopped them, asking who allowed them to leave. This enraged the three brothers, as one of them charged at Bitcher, cursing at him, and tried to stab him with a knife. He declared that he was the older one between him and Bitcher so Bitcher should not look down on him. However, he had forgotten one thing. Knives didn't work on Bitcher whose body had been strengthened by river sticks. The blade only pierced the layer of clothing, failing to do any damage. Bitcher grabbed his hand and twisted it, making the dagger fall to the ground and causing him to scream in pain. Bitcher didn't let go of the hand despite the screaming and stated as a matter of fact, this is Baskerville. Something like age doesn't matter if you have strength and talent. A grin crept up on his face as his eyes glowed. He said, let's play till the end, older brothers. He was not planning on letting any of them leave just like this. Just as the realization dawned on him, Bitcher punched him in the face, breaking his teeth and knocking him down. Such a scene enraged the other brothers and they wanted to join in. But without giving them a moment, Bitcher kicked him down effortlessly. Seeing such a display of power, they realized the difference in strength and were scared. However, Bitcher said that there was no need to be scared. If they got treated in time, there wouldn't be much of a problem. He picked up the dagger that had fallen to the ground earlier, and stated with a smile that he would let one of them go, and kill the other two. The brothers were surprised and skeptical. They asked who was Bitcher going to let go while writhing in pain. To their utter disbelief, Bitcher threw the dagger towards them, and told them that it was up to them to decide. He wanted them to fight each other, and the winner would get to live. Before leaving the room, he fanned the flames saying that at least one of them should live with an amused smile on his face. The door closed with a subtle thud, and the three brothers eyed each other with wariness, the tension in the room growing so thick that one could cut it with a dagger. Outside the room, Bitcher listened to the sounds of struggle coming from the inside and thought about how Hugo LeBaskerville's trident had crumbled in itself, without much effort from him. In another place, Baskerville's head butler, John Barrymore explained matters regarding other clans to the clan head, Hugo Le Baskerville. He also told Hugo that young master Hugo got first place in the midterm assessment written exam at the children's castle. Hugo looked pleased upon hearing the news and asked when the practical exams were going to be held. John told him that it will be held in five days and that the children's castle's guardian knights are on a trip to prepare for it. After hesitating for a bit, John addressed the clan head, wanting to tell him something about the children's castle. He told him that there was a big fight in the children's castle recently. Hugo had a serious look as he heard the news, and asked how many casualties there were. John told him that no one really died but young Master Hybro's teeth are completely damaged, young Master Midbro's jaws have sunk in and young Master Lobro's finger was cut off. They all received treatment from the priest and healed, but they had taken a lot of mental damage. Hugo was a little surprised at hearing this. He remembered that the three brothers were very close, and wouldn't have fought each other. John told him that it was because they fought one of their younger siblings, the same person who had gotten first place in the written exam he just told Hugo about, young master Bitchier. Hugo was shocked and decided to have a talk with Bitchier. They called for Bitchier who soon arrived. After the pleasantries, Hugo got straight to the point and asked him why he had crippled the triplets in the advanced class. Bitcher opted to play the role of an innocent kid, saying that the triplet received appropriate treatment and should have gotten better. Hugo stressed that he was not talking about the physical injuries, but instead the mental trauma the triplet suffered. He then explained how since that day, the three brothers have started eating separately and even stopped talking with each other. He remarked how their three-way combination attack had potential to grow into a work of art, but because of Bitcher, a massive rift had formed between them. Bitcher didn't reply, instead choosing to stay silent. After all, everything had happened as he intended it to. Hugo asked Bitcher why did he do something like turning his older brothers into a total wreck. 
Bichir who had been silent until now simply stated that he was stronger than them, and a strong person doesn't make mistakes. Hugo paused but for a brief moment, before telling him that he had a chat with the triplet, and they decided to forgive Bichir's actions. He asked if Bichir felt any sort of guilt. Forgave me, said Bichir with amusement. He remembered in his previous life. There was once a time when the last child of a clan that had perished to the Baskerville clan came to meet Hugo directly. She, who had become a nun after all those years, came to tell him that she forgave him. And after hearing that, Hugo responded with but one cold line. I believe that forgiveness is nothing more than the sorry excuse of the weak who can't get revenge. Bitcher repeated those exact same words at this moment, which made Hugo smile like an insane person. He hadn't expected such an answer from such a young child. Hugo agreed with Bichir, saying that strength was justice and being weak was a sin. He praised Bichir for understanding the teachings of the Baskerville clan. Hugo, pleasantly surprised, addressed John standing next to him and asked him to take Bichir to the food warehouse and let him have whatever he wanted. He said to not let Bichir be too greedy and take as much as he wants as long as he can carry them. On the surface, Bitcher showed a smile and thanked Hugo, seemingly excited at the prospect of eating chocolate. Just as John and Bitcher were about to leave the room, Hugo called Bitcher from behind. He told him to do well in the upcoming practical exam and not lose to anyone from the main house. Bitcher, through gritted teeth and hatred in his eyes, showed compliance and told him not to worry about anything. John took Bitcher to the food warehouse and presented him with the chocolate that the young girls of the Morgue clan who are rumored to be gourmets, enjoy. However, Bitcher was not interested in anything processed, which made John quite confused. Bitcher requested cacao beans, a kind with a very strong flavor. Though confused, John did as he was asked to, and produced a bag of bloody beans. Just one of such a bean was enough to make 100 liters of chocolate. Bitcher took the bag of beans and tasted one, wincing at the strong flavor. The chef asked Bitcher if he should take the beans to his room after processing them. Bichir refused the offer, saying that he wanted them as they were, unprocessed. This statement made John very confused. Previously he had thought that Bichir wanted to take the cacao beans so he could have a lot of chocolate. But now he was thinking whether the young master just has a weird taste. In fact, Bichir did not want the bloody beans to eat. Their real purpose would soon come up in the practical exam in five days. Thanks to his knowledge of the future, Bichir knew that on that day, an unprecedented and a massive incident will happen in the Baskerville clan. The Baskerville clan was called the Berserker clan by the rest of the world. Every child born there was put through an education program. They had to climb up a steep mountain for basic stamina training right after learning how to walk and resting was not allowed outside of designated times. At bedtime, they would have to sleep with a corpse of a demonic creature or a baby demonic creature in order to adapt to the tough environment. Once that period ended and the children turned eight years old, they would be faced with assessments of gruesome difficulties. That was the reason why the Baskerville clan earned the name of Berserker clan. Time flew by fast, and the day of the practical exam came. The young hounds gathered at Mount Le Rouge et Le Noir, a mountain filled with demonic creatures that were captured at the borders of their territory. Baskerville clan instructor guide dog, Pavlov Van Baskerville, stood facing the young hounds that would be taking the practical exam this time, with the rest of his companions that were covered in hoods. Pavlov addressed the participants and explained the contents of the practical exam. Only two things needed to be kept in mind. One was to survive on this mountain for a month, and the second was to hunt strong demonic creatures that were roaming the mountain. The point system worked like this. Zero points for dying, 10 points for successfully saving someone's life, 30 points for saving someone's life without being heavily injured, 50 points for surviving by eliminating another participant, 70 points for hunting down a demonic creature and surviving, 90 points for meeting all the conditions stated beforehand. 100 points, there was no way to get that high of a score. In addition to all that, a badge was handed to each participant, and stealing someone else's badge would reward them with bonus points. All the students were getting nervous and anxious listening to the instructions. The test was very dangerous, and they couldn't fully trust each other either. Pavlo continued, advising them to make sure to not leave the designated area where only the subjugated demonic creatures lived. Outside was unknown and unexplored territory with many terrifying demonic creatures living inside. During the exam period, the guide dogs, or also called the guardian knights, would be overseeing every move of the participants and secretly score them. Alongside the rest of the participants stood Bichir but unlike everyone, he was not nervous at all. 
In fact, he was even a little excited since he had not been here in a while. Around him, the other participants were discussing rumors about how he had stayed in the river sticks for seven minutes, or how he killed two poisonous snakes as a baby. The triplet of brothers also tried their best to not make eye contact with him. Pavlo took out a bell, and told them the timer begins when I ring this bell. Just as the first clang of the bell resounded, all the participants dispersed instantly, disappearing from sight, not wanting to miss a beat. Some decided to secure an advantageous position first, while some followed behind others, intending on stealing their points. The triplet of brothers moved together, but the discontent between them was very clear. After the students disappeared, Pavlo took out a cigarette and lit it, thinking to himself. It was not forbidden but the exam did not encourage killing. Since there were point deductions for killing, everyone will try their best to avoid killing others with their own hands, and utilize some other means. At least the deaths will be to a minimum with the guard dogs watching over them, he thought as he took a puff from his cigarette. After the practical exam started, one of the guard dogs followed Bitcher all the way to the edge of the safe zone, near the unexplored area. The guard dog member was confused about what the young master planned to do. He had naturally heard of the rumors surrounding Bitcher as well and Bitcher's unparalleled talent was not a secret. He looked forward to seeing the talented young master in action. However, his expectations were going to be shattered soon. Bitcher came to an open area with a huge tree devoid of leaves. He checked the ground and made sure everything was right, and then decided to stay there for the time being. It was time for him to enjoy his vacation. The guard dog who had heard him was astonished. While the other participants fought against each other and against dangerous demonic beasts, Bitcher collected wood for the fire, dug many a holes, and slept inside a makeshift hut that he conjured himself. He was living a relaxed life and enjoying it. The guard dog following him was fed up with how Bitcher was acting. All he did was waste his own time by sitting around like this. He wondered if he just planned on hiding here till the end of the exam. The guard dog even started doubting whether the rumors about him were true or not. In the end, he decided to leave, thinking there was no need for him to watch over someone who planned on hiding until the end. Bitcher, who had been living a life of camping out in the wilderness, suddenly turned his gaze to the corner where the guard dog had been a moment ago. He had sensed the man leaving. Looking at the bonfire he had built, a memory from his past life surfaced. It was his team member telling him that cacao beans were the best for removing gamey smell from the meat. Bitcher took out a few bloody beans and threw them into the fire. The hindrance was finally gone. The area around him was covered in spike pits. His hunting ground was ready. Now he could begin his hunt. A few days later, past the iron fence with a warning skull on it, Bitcher walked into the unexplored area of the mountain. Or at least it was what it was called right now. Before his regression, as a scout, he knew this area like the back of his hand. He analyzed the clues around him. A scorching scent that stings the nose and dead burnt roots. All of them were signs that made him believe that it was the habitat of the creature he was looking for. It was not long before he encountered it. He got sick of them in his scout days, but seeing one at this time was quite welcome for him. A towering dog that was encased in fire stared down at him from a raised cliff. It was a hellhound, a dog with hell in its mouth that growled at the tiny human like it wanted to rip him apart. Before Bitcher regressed, he was only able to fight one by himself after he turned 18. Fighting one head-on with the body of an 8-year-old was impossible. However, he knew of a method that would let even a child defeat a hellhound. Smiling, he ran straight towards the hellhound, who also ran towards him. But right before the moment of impact, Bitcher did a sharp turn and successfully avoided the burning claws aiming to rip him apart. That was the first weakness of the hellhounds. They can only move in a straight line and have a hard time following sharp changes in direction. Bitcher then took out a bottle of water from his pocket and poured it on the ground. The second weakness of the hellhounds. For some reason, the demonic creatures cannot cross water regardless of how little there is. The hellhound that was approaching him again turned around and detoured to the side of the water instead of walking through it. This caused it to lose a lot of speed. The hellhound plunged at Bitcher, its mouth open and growling. Bitcher took advantage of the opportunity to the fullest and threw something into its mouth with exceptional marksmanship. The hellhound missed Bitcher, who had stepped aside to avoid the attack, and landed on the ground. As it landed, it immediately started whimpering and collapsed into a ruined mess. The final weakness of the hellhound, chocolate. After all, chocolate is poisonous to dog-type monsters, and when it was a bloody bean that could make 100 liters of chocolate. The effect was very obvious by the collapsed hellhound. Bitcher unsheathed the sword he had and aimed at the collapsed demonic beast. 
It was effective to target a place that was weakened, but also wasn't protected by the sturdy rib cage. There was only one such spot, the kidney. Witcher accurately pinpointed his target and stabbed with precision. The hellhound struggled a bit, but died soon. From the corpse of the hellhound, blue light rose and condensed into Bitcher's hand. Killing a demonic creature bestows experience or karma to the body, which leads to the strengthening of the body. Bitcher swung the short sword he was holding and could already feel a difference. The short sword felt much lighter now. If he kept going at this pace, he would be able to regain his peak strength from before regression before even becoming an adult. Looking at the dead body of the demonic beast, Bitcher wondered what kind of face Hugo would make upon learning that an eight-year-old had defeated a hellhound on his own. He was sure just this was enough to rank first on the exam and had even decided on which reward to ask for. It was something he could have only dreamed about before regression. Now he was, planning to monopolize that object which nobody knew the true value of yet. Just as he was about to cut off the head to take with him, he heard the sound of footsteps and looked back, only to find a pack of hellhounds. Bitcher cut off the head of the already dead hellhound and turned around, fully prepared to kill all of them. He had a lot of bloody beans left so he was not planning on leaving after just killing one anyways. Suddenly, all the hellhounds started shaking with fear. Bitcher knew it couldn't be because of bloodlust from a mere eight-year-old. Normally, hellhounds would rather die than submit to their prey unless there was another apex predator behind him. Bitcher looked back and was surprised to find a three-headed, towering monster, Cerberus. A Cerberus was a creature with a demonic rating of a plus. Bitcher couldn't understand why a creature that should be in the seventh ridge was in the first ridge. After looking carefully, he realized that the Cerberus was bleeding and had numerous wounds all over its body. Someone must have been trying to hunt it. Now that he thought about it, the barbarian tribe lived on the other side of the mountain. It was very likely that the Cerberus was chased down all the way here by the barbarian tribe. This was a great opportunity that he had to avail, even by using everything he had. Bitcher had been hiding his skills within the Baskerville clan. His mastery over the sword had already reached the stage of a high sword expert, meaning he could imbue mana into his sword for an attack boost. And his mastery of the Baskerville third fang had already reached the level other hounds would only eat during adulthood. Bitcher infused his short sword with mana and charged at the Cerberus slashed at its face. With nimble movements, he performed multiple attacks within a moment. He was confident that he could kill an injured Cerberus. Before his regression, his sword techniques had been polished to the point there were no unnecessary movements. On top of that, his body had been strengthened by the river sticks. The weapons Bitcher had were more than enough to deal damage to the injured Cerberus. At least, that's what he thought. However, the truth was far from it. The Cerberus growled and went in for an attack, easily shattering the short sword upon impact. The shock caused by this provided an opening to the Cerberus, and it capitalized on it to use its claws. Bitcher was struck by Cerberus claws and was sent flying, crashing into a tree while coughing out blood. Tanking such a strong attack, Bitcher's consciousness slipped and he blacked out for a moment. Waking up with a jolt, Bitcher saw the Cerberus slowly approaching, the distance between them not that big. He also couldn't feel his left arm, wondering if it had been torn off. However, upon looking at it, he saw that there was only one big wound. Granted it was deep enough that it rendered his arm useless for the moment, but getting it treated would resolve the issue. Even if the Cerberus was wounded, he had expected far worse than this. It was all thanks to the body strengthening of the river sticks. Bitcher praised the river sticks and hurriedly moved out of the way of the Cerberus, who had pounced on him. Bitcher assessed his overall situation. Surviving another strong hit seemed difficult, river sticks's power or not. However, even in a difficult situation, a veteran hunter like him always looked for the best course forward and the best action he could take right now was the 36th stratagem, retreat. Bitcher turned around and ran as fast as he could. If the Cerberus was not injured, it would have already caught up to him and torn him to pieces. Thankfully, with its current state, Bitcher could barely outrun it. After running for a while, Bitcher came across the steel fence that marked the boundary of the explored region. He swiftly jumped over the fence with nimble movements and continued running seamlessly. He wanted to reach the place he had prepared, only then did he have any chances of survival. Otherwise, if he was caught before that, he would be dead. The Cerberus was relentless in its pursuit, slowly decreasing the gap between itself and its marked prey. Just when Bitcher was about to be caught, 
He reached his destination. It was the place where he had camped before and dug around some spike traps. Bitcher jumped over a pit that was covered with mud to catch people off guard, and with just the distance of a few inches between him and the Cerberus' open jaws, the Cerberus stepped into the pit and sank, getting impaled by multiple spikes. Seeing Cerberus screaming in pain, Bitcher wiped his sweat and heaved a sigh of relief who knew that the traps he had made to deal with the Hellhound pack would come in handy catching a Cerberus. Just like the Hellhounds, Cerberus was also a dog-type monster, and in his preparation to deal with the Hellhound pack, Bitcher had coated the spearheads in the pits with bloody bean extract. The bloody beans did their magic and severely weakened the already weakened Cerberus, but it refused to back down, growling even more intensely as a last form of resistance. Bitcher held a spear in his hand and threw it with precision at the Cerberus, striking it hard. The Cerberus finally climbed out of the pit of spikes and started moving towards Bitcher with slow steps. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. After taking seven steps and almost reaching Bitcher, the Cerberus collapsed helplessly on the ground. Bitcher heaved a sigh of relief at this sight. It was finally over. The wooden spear he had thrown at the last was a bit different from the rest, as it was coated with the poison from the bloody mamba. It was very difficult to obtain but luckily he had stashed some aside from when he was attacked as a baby. After the death of Cerberus all three heads, the blue light rose from its corpse and swirled around Bitchir, as Bitchir gained the experience points from killing and a plus rank demonic beast. Now Bitchir had to think about how to take Cerberus' corpse with him. Since the cause of death would be clear, he wondered if the guardian knights who saw him prepare the traps would testify for him or not. However, he could worry about that later. Right now he had something else to focus on. Cerberus was a gatekeeper type monster that had a habit of protecting its territory. If a Cerberus was here, then there would definitely be a dungeon near the place it was defending. Dungeons are a strange space that holds treasures. They are also sometimes inhabited by powerful demonic creatures. Bitchir decided to cover himself with Cerberus scent, covering himself in mud. This way he would be able to avoid confrontation with most demonic creatures in the dungeon. Dry and crumbling dirt, rotten leaves, damp roots as well as the Cerberus footsteps. Bitcher followed all sorts of traces he could track and finally found its lair, the dungeon that Cerberus was in. The dungeon appeared dark and dangerous. Bitcher remembered coming here before his regression. It was going to be discovered in 10 years from now on, and at the time of its discovery, it was empty. But it was different right now. The smell of decay and the scent of mana both intertwined, making Bitcher sure that it hadn't been cleared yet. With palpable excitement, Bitcher stepped inside, wondering what kind of treasures were awaiting him. Bitcher walked through the dark cave without encountering a single monster along the path. Occasionally, he noticed the presence of ruby veins along the wall in multiple locations. Bitcher thought that it must be connected to the Red Fang Mountain, which was a branch of Mount La Rouge at Lenoir. After walking for a while, Bitcher encountered light at the end of the tunnel. It most likely meant that he had reached inside the dungeon. As he entered, an open area covered in stone greeted him. There was a platform in the middle, with a big ruby on top that emitted a red light, lighting everything. The platform was a contraption that released light by absorbing mana and sending it to the ruby. As he moved closer, Bitcher noticed a skeleton corpse with a node in front of it. There were injuries all over the body of the corpse, as if hacked away by a wildly swung knife. And a lot of time seemed to have passed, since all the blood had dried brown by now. Bitcher picked up the note that was in front of the skeleton and read it. He recognized the handwriting on the note instantly. It was the same penmanship that had been handed down in the Baskerville clan for generations. There was a high chance that the person who had written the note was a Baskerville. The note read as the following. My name doesn't matter so I will refer to myself with the vague name of Cain. I am recording this because I wish for the people who come after me to not make the same mistakes I did. My household legends say that this place is an ancient dungeon, and my younger brother Abel stumbled upon it. We overcame innumerable trials as we raided this dungeon. After killing a myriad of monsters, and making it to this stone chamber, we came across the ultimate riddle here. This riddle tied us down for a long time, for a whole of three years. To persist for three years, they must have coveted the treasure very badly, remarked Bitchir. He thought the mentioned ultimate riddle must still be within this stone chamber. Not long after, he already found the so-called ultimate riddle. The riddle read, What entered was once one, but within has become two. Only as one may they leave. After finding the riddle, Bitcher continued reading the contents written on the note. They were. With this dismal riddle standing between my younger brother and I, we pondered for a long time. And we both arrived at the same conclusion. We, twins, were conceived in our mother's womb. 
were once one, but by the time we were born, we had been split in two. Hence to leave this dungeon with what we wished for, we must both become one again. That meant that of the two of us, only one could leave with the thing we coveted. Thus we fought, and after a long and intense battle, I killed my brother. Then, only one person remained in the stone chamber, but even then nothing happened. I had killed my brother, murdered him, but still couldn't obtain anything. After an eternity of regret, I decided to leave this place. If there are any brave descendants who come here, leave immediately. There is nothing to be gained here in this demonic place. As Bichir read the full note, he was skeptical. Even though he was not a twin, he was still presented with the same riddle. It could only mean one thing, that Cain and Abel both interpreted the riddle incorrectly and died in vain. Bichir racked his brain hard, thinking what could be the answer to the riddle. A dungeon that could not be raided didn't exist. There had to be an answer to the riddle. He just had to think hard. All of a sudden, it clicked in his mind. Figuring it out this fast, Bitcher couldn't help but shake his head for the two brothers. He felt that Abel and Cain happened to be very unlucky. They were both caught up in their preconceptions and were unable to solve the riddle, even though it was a surprisingly simple riddle. And the answer was present in the dungeon. Bitcher stepped closer to the platform and reached out his hand towards the large ruby while speaking. The dark tunnel contrasts the bright stone chamber. When he entered the tunnel, he was one with his shadow due to the darkness. But the moment he reached the stone chamber, he became two because of the ruby's light, one his shadow and the other him. If it became dark again, then the riddle would be solved by him becoming one with his shadow in the dark. Bitcher punched and shattered the ruby that was emitting the light, plunging the stone chamber into darkness. The next moment, a stone wall opened. Beyond the stone wall was another stone chamber with a platform in the middle. However, instead of a ruby, this time there was a sinister-looking sword that emitted a dark aura. Bichir recognized the sword instantly and was shocked. He couldn't find the legendary sword Beelzebub that could only be drawn by the Baskerville clan was located in such a place. He remembered seeing its illustration once before his regression in a book on mythology. The Fly of Gluttony, Beelzebub in the ancient myths of the unprecedented great demons who invaded the continent, there were seven calamities, the demon constellations. In order to stop the seven calamities, the leaders of the seven great clans each stepped up and faced one of the demon constellations. At that time, the demon that the Baskerville clans had faced was the fly of gluttony, Beelzebub. As so, the remains of the subjugated Beelzebub were sealed away in the Baskerville territory. That's how the legend went, however no one believed in it today. But Bichir knew that the legend was actually true. This sword would fall into the hands of the demons in the future and would bring about great destruction. But that was the story of his past life. In this life, something like that would not happen, because the sword was going to be his. With excitement dancing in his eyes, Bichir stepped forward and attempted to pull out the sword from the stone platform. Suddenly the aura of the sword erupted, growing stronger by the minute. The aura then converged and was absorbed into the back of his hand. The sword on the altar disappeared entirely, and took on a different form as a blade that extended from Bitcher's wrist. Bitcher looked at the sword made from the remains of a demon constellation and burned with exhilaration. He had not expected such a great harvest from his trip. First the power of the river sticks and now the blade of Beelzebub, coupled with his unparalleled talent. There was no way to predict how strong he would become. Done with everything in the dungeon, Bitcher was planning to head back when suddenly dizziness came over him, causing him to fall to his knees. Intense hunger pangs assaulted him while the Beelzebub on his hand buzzed loudly. Beelzebub was telling Bitcher to feed it something. Bitcher walked out of the dungeon and the cave weakly. The insane appetite made him feel like his stomach was being torn apart. Not only that, his sense of smell also felt extremely enhanced. And thanks to it, he caught a scent of something delicious. Beelzebub wriggled and pointed in a direction, as if telling Bitcher there was something delicious to eat over in that direction. After Bitcher followed the direction it was pointing to, he came across the corpse of the hellhound he had defeated. The blade of the Beelzebub extended, embedding itself into the flesh of the corpse and sucking its blood. As the blood flowed through the Beelzebub and into Bitcher, he finally felt the hunger subside. He guessed that Beelzebub must have been starving for a long time, being confined in a dungeon. He only hoped that the dry land and withered three in the Mount La Rouge at Lenoir were not caused by the insane hunger of Beelzebub. Otherwise he had no idea how he would be able to feed this thing. After it finished feeding, it emitted a happy buzzing sound, and some words appeared in front of Bitcher. He thought that it must be the unique skill of Beelzebub. Beelzebub, the gluttonous fly. It was told that it had the ability to turn its opponent's ability into its own. 
It could practically absorb an infinite amount of skills and those who were absorbed were utterly destroyed. However, it appeared that there was the maximum amount of skills Bitcher could absorb since this Beelzebub was just made from its corpse. The skill he had absorbed from the Hellhound, Hellhound Hemorrhage. It was a skill that made even the smallest of scratches pull out obscene amounts of blood. A light bulb went off inside Bitcher's mind. Since he could absorb skills with this unique skill, he had to try something. He quickly made his way back to his camp and decided to try absorbing the Cerberus he had killed earlier. As the Beelzebub started devouring Cerberus' corpse, Bitcher told it to not drink too much because it would be hard to explain the kind of damage that would do. Beelzebub kept devouring the corpse, and Bitcher eyed it suspiciously. He had to slap it to make it stop, otherwise it would have devoured the whole corpse. Beelzebub buzzed again, as though it was hurt. Bitcher looked at the list of skills he had absorbed in total and found two new skills in addition to the hemorrhage he had gotten from the Hellhound. Those skills were Incinerate, which was an A-plus skill and Rapid Generation, which was an F skill. Bitcher was surprised that Beelzebub had even eaten the brown rat corpse that was hidden under Cerberus. He didn't dwell much on it. Just getting the Incinerate skill was a huge harvest. Since one of the worst ways to die was by getting burned, it was much more foul than the Hellhound's hemorrhage. Since Bitcher had already procured the demonic creature corpse needed to pass the practical exam, he decided to relax for the rest of the days. Time passed fast. The young hounds of Baskerville returned after finishing their practical assessment. The evaluation followed after that and the corpses of the demonic creatures that the young hounds caught were crafted into shields, swords, necklaces and other similar things before being returned to them as the spoils. One of those demonic creature corpses that a young hound brought shocked the Baskervilles who were there. Hugo asked John to repeat himself, as he couldn't believe what he had just heard. John told him that young Master Bitcher who is eight years old accidentally crossed into the unexplored area during his exam and hunted a Cerberus, a monster with a danger rating of a plus. Hearing it twice, Hugo still couldn't believe it. John explained that the Cerberus had already been injured from the barbarian tribes, and then was poisoned. When Hugo asked where had Bitcher gotten such a strong poison, John told him that he didn't know because it was not listed in the hunting log. Even when he asked the young master, he didn't receive a straight answer. Hugo didn't seem to mind it, and even had a smile on his face as he praised Bitcher for having knowledge and using it as his power. John said that he was extremely surprised as well. A young master with the name of Van had such great talent. He was not even all Orla. Hugo stopped John and said that he was different from the previous clan heads. He didn't care about bloodline and only cared about pure talent and their determination. He said that even weaklings could come from good bloodlines. John understood that Hugo was talking about his second son that was in secluded training and apologized. Hugo dismissed him with a wave of his hand, saying he was fine and told him to call for Bitchier. Not long after, Bitchier stood facing Hugo. Hugo asked him how he managed to kill a ferocious monster such as Cerberus. Bitchier didn't hide anything and explained that he fed it chocolate to kill it. He told Hugo that since chocolate is practically a deadly poison to dog-type monsters, he used what he got from the food warehouse to kill it. John, who was listening in on the conversation, felt perplexed. It didn't feel like a conversation between a father and a son to him, with both of them just going back and forth on questions and answers without even saying hello. Hugo asked Bitcher why he didn't tell John when he asked about the specifics of the hunt. Bitcher replied coldly without missing a beat that it was because he wasn't his master. After being asked who his master was, he said that since he was a member of the clan, the clan head was his master. Hugo praised Bitcher, saying he had learned well. As a reward, he was going to give the corpse of the demonic creature he had killed solely to him. And since he had placed first in the practical exam, he would also grant him a wish. It was the moment Bitcher was waiting for. He already had his answer prepared. He said that he wanted to enter the 10,000 Book Library. The 10,000 Book Library. It was a massive library located in the deepest parts of the Baskerville clan's main castle. This library was one of the biggest libraries in the Empire. Hearing his request, Hugo's demeanor changed as he asked in a serious voice whether he knew that only the clan head, vice head and members of the main castle are allowed to enter. Listening to this, Bitcher conceded, saying that if it wasn't allowed, he would give up on it. It was going to be a pain, but he would have to sneak in on his own later. Just when he was having such thoughts, he was surprised when he heard Hugo give permission. His surprise didn't end there. Hugo continued saying that he wanted Bitcher to read Baskerville Swordsmanship, Sixth Fang which was located in the Sixth Restricted Area. Bitcher couldn't believe that Hugo would let an illegitimate child read the Sixth Fang. 
There had never been a case of an illegitimate child with the middle name of Van ever reading beyond the fourth fang. Bichir calmed himself down, telling himself that the sixth fang was not that impressive. Hugo currently was able to use the seventh fang and before he regressed, he was capable of drawing out even nine fangs. He still hadn't forgotten the scorn he received as an illegitimate child. In this life, Bichir planned to surpass Hugo by getting his hands on the swordsmanship scripture which contains Baskerville's true and pure essence. It was discovered later in his past life and was written by the Baskerville's first clan head who had killed one of the seven calamities. Hugo wished Bichir good luck in learning the sixth fang and said that he looked forward to it. Bitcher expressed his gratitude on the surface, while mocking Hugo for handing him something that he didn't even know the true value of. Inside the 10,000 books library, Bitcher walked among the rows of cabinets filled with books. It was Bitcher's first time entering this place. He looked at some of the books that were present there, severing incisor swordsmanship, crushing molar swordsmanship and many more titles went past his eyes. All of them were scriptures he wanted to learn prior to his regression. In the Baskerville clan, no matter how much mana an illegitimate child had, they were not allowed to learn any swordsmanship above the fourth fang. It was a policy within the clan so that the prawns meant to be hunting dogs can't bear their fangs to direct descendants that will become the masters. After walking for a while, he finally came across the scripture containing the sixth fang of Baskerville swordsmanship. It was a book bound tightly and locked, restricting access to most people. Even as he stood in front of it, Bitcher still couldn't believe that Hugo would allow an illegitimate child like him to learn the sixth fang. He inserted the key he had gotten into the lock and twisted it. Before his regression, Bitcher studied the theory behind the first and the fourth fang swordsmanship like a madman. It was to the point that he had started to correctly guess the fifth fang, which he was never taught. Now reading the scripture of the sixth fang, he finally understood the reason he couldn't make the fifth fang. After the fourth fang, he needed to snap the flow of mana once. In the Baskerville swordsmanship, every level was defined by fangs. Level 1 was one fang, level 2 was two fangs and so on. It was characterized by the crimson sword aura expelled when you draw the fangs. Bitcher hurriedly flipped through the pages of the book, getting a general sense of it. He doesn't didn't care about the sixth fang. He was here today for a different goal, something even higher level than the sixth fang. As Bitcher came out of the depth of the library, the two guards were surprised to see him leave so early. They thought that he was leaving to get something and offered to get it for him. But Bitcher was really done with his business in the deeper section of the library. He told the guards that he planned on skimming through other scriptures before leaving and asked them to ignore him. As Bitcher turned to leave, the guards started whispering among themselves, thinking that he didn't know the true value of the books in the library because he was young, or if it were them, they would read every single book in there. Bitcher could hear their whispers, but didn't care. After all, there was no way they could have known that between the dusty, miscellaneous scriptures, a treasure was hidden. After searching for a while, Bitcher finally found a scripture with the name lurking embedded teeth. Despite it being an extremely unremarkable appearance-wise, he was sure that this was the item he was looking for. Because all the pages in the middle were torn out, not even the children bothered with this and thus was classified as part of the lowly miscellaneous category. However, Bitcher knew the true value of this seemingly ordinary book. Before his regression, the hound unit he was a part of found a strange relic inside the dungeon that was on the border of Mount La Rouge at Lenoir. It was a piece of swordsmanship scripture, a single, torn out page. A page from a swordsmanship scripture written in Baskerville handwriting. Noticing that something seemed off about this, Hugo had people search through the entirety of the 10,000 book library to find the matching book. That book was the swordsmanship scripture called Lurking Embedded Teeth. This scripture that was personally written by an ancestral Baskerville detailed the method to reach Baskerville Tenth Fang. Losing his mind over the thought of the Tenth Fang, Hugo unleashed the hounds, searching for the whereabouts of the remaining six pages. Learning that the remaining pages were hidden in each of the other seven great clans, Hugo almost declared war against the other clans, unleashing the hounds against anyone that resisted. After countless hounds were sacrificed, they were finally able to offer all the remaining pages to Hugo. The reward for all of that was just a mere statement of good job from Hugo. Just thinking about that made Bitcher's blood boil with anger. He knew how stupid of a life that was. Thanks to all the pages and the scripture, Hugo overcame the wall of the seventh fang and managed to reach the ninth fang, using the blood and corpses of the hounds below him as fodder. 
The hound that fetched all those pages was none other than Bitcher himself. He remembered the contents of all the lost pages. However, the reason he wasn't able to advance past the fourth fang was because he never got to see the source text before. Bitcher opened the scripture and started reading it. In its current state, the book only seemed to contain lofty nonsense, but the moment the torn out pages were put into their rightful place, the content that seemed like pretentious fabrications turned into a puzzle that depicts an epic painting. Before his regression, Bitcher was at the level of fourth fang in swordsmanship and high rank sword graduate in aura. Now he vowed to reach that level of strength before he turned 15. The day turned to night and the night turned to day as Bitcher immersed himself into reading the scripture. Only after he was done memorizing it that he snapped out of his reverie, realizing how much time had passed. However, thanks to that, he had memorized the book to the point he could read it backwards. Bitcher stood up and stretched his tense body. He couldn't sense the presence of the Guardian Knight so he decided to test what he had learned today. He may be unable to draw out up to the tenth fang with just a child's body, but he was sure he could at least draw out the fifth fang with his current situation. Closing his eyes, he visualized a virtual opponent and unleashed a barrage of attacks, each successive attack becoming more aggressive, ferocious and dangerous than its predecessor. The first fang, the second fang, the third fang, the fourth fang, all the rage building inside of Bitcher was boiling. Before regressing, he lived a shabby life. He was able to obtain the highest rank sword graduate aura after years of hard work but was still looked down upon by the main house because he wasn't able to learn a swordsmanship fit for it. And the only reason he was unable to reach the fifth fang or higher before was because he was an illegitimate child. Bitcher refused to live such a sad and terrible life again. In his mind, the virtual enemy morphed into the image of Hugo he was most familiar with, and then he unleashed it on his sworn enemy, the sixth fang. It cut the image of Hugo into multiple pieces, completely annihilating it. Bitcher breathed hard. The power was a little lacking but he had managed to draw the fifth fang. A warm feeling rose from his heart, making him almost choke. Bitcher wanted to cry tears of joy at reaching the fifth fang. In the entire history of Baskerville, the young hound's fangs were growing faster than anyone else's, and they were aimed at his master's throat. Bitcher had succeeded in drawing the fifth fang already. If he could just boost his mana now, he would be able to reach the point he was at before he regressed. The mana hole was growing steadily. It had grown by a whole dimension through enlightenment just this time. With just a little bit of concentration, Bitcher materialized a flowing liquid red aura around his hand. It signified his advancement into the realm of a sword graduate. It was the level he had reached when he was 30 years old before his regression, and now he has reached it at only the age of 8. Sword graduate was on a completely different level than sword expert. As the gaseous aura turns into liquid form, its density increases, and its ability to change form becomes less limited. Bitcher had also obtained a swordsmanship greater than the one he wielded before he regressed, one that doesn't just stop at the fifth fang, but can even reach the tenth fang. The stabbing canine he had learned previously had explosive growth, but it also had clear limits. Compared to that, the lurking embedded teeth was a perfect swordsmanship that fused both offense and defense and had no limits to its growth. At his current level, Bitcher could even face someone at the level of medium sword graduate. If it was an assassination, he was sure of 100% chance of success and 50% chance of success if it was a frontal assault. Now Bitcher had to think about how much power he should reveal to Hugo. He didn't want to seem too weak or too strong. He wanted to plant a sufficient level of expectations in him to continue to reap benefits from him. Bitcher took out a magnifying glass from his pocket and used the sunlight filtering through the window with it to burn the book containing the lurking embedded teeth. He grinned as he saw the flames take the book. With this, the chance that Hugo and his hunting dogs would reach the tenth fang was gone for good. Except for Bitcher, the burning smell caught the attention of the two guards as they rushed to see the situation. Bitcher, who had done it intentionally, acted as though it was a mistake caused by his carelessness and apologized. The guards assured him that he had nothing to apologize for. The fault lay with them for not taking care of him enough. They said that it was a relief that it was only a random unimportant book that got burnt. Bitcher agreed with them, saying that all the books here are miscellaneous anyways. He then steered the conversation to the workload of the knights, more importantly their conflict with the Moor clan over the ruby mine. He told them to not pay any attention to little problems like this and suggested that they could act like this never happened. 
The guards were more than willing to agree. Bichir then left, telling them to keep it all a secret between themselves. The guards thanked Bichir, thinking he was a very understanding and good person who even thought of his servant's perspective. All the while Bichir couldn't hold back his smile from having destroyed the future of the Baskerville clan. In the room, Bichir stood facing Hugo who was sitting on a chair, and John who stood behind him like always. Hugo asked whether Bichir had any enlightenment inside the 10,000 book library. Bichir replied that he did but only a little bit. After Hugo asked him what he felt and realized, he explained that he felt something warm and sharp, while also soft and wave-like. Both John and Hugo were surprised upon hearing Bitcher's description. They suspected that it could be Aura. Aura was proof that one had truly entered the world of the sword. Even prodigies who train without rest had to be at least 15 years old to enter the realm of low-rank sword expert. Hugo shook his head, thinking he had jumped to a conclusion too soon. After all, Bitcher was only 8 years old at the time. He asked Bitcher to demonstrate his power, to which Bitcher agreed readily. In a huge area filled with a bustling crowd, Bitcher held his short sword in his right hand and stood confidently. On the seat specifically reserved for the clan head sat Hugo, with John behind him like always. John asked Hugo how he planned to test the young master's strength, to which Hugo told him that he was going to release a suitable demonic beast for him to hunt. A demonic beast that was starved to make it more sensitive. With loud noises, the iron gates opened as a bulky green humanoid figure bound tightly in chains was escorted out by a guardian knight. The creature growled with red glowing eyes as though hungry for human flesh. It was an orc, a demonic beast with a danger rating of C. The audience marveled at the sight of the towering orc being brought in. They of course recognized the monster and knew of its danger. They felt that making an 8-year-old fight against an orc was a little too much. One needed to be at least 15 to be capable of facing one. However, they weren't too worried. It was because if anything went awry, the Guardian Knights would step in to salvage the situation. When the orc reached Bichir, the height difference between them became very clear. The orc towering over him, it was more than double his height. At the wave of a hand of Hugo, the Guardian Knight released the chains of the orc. The chains hit the ground with a loud metallic sound and the orc could finally move freely. The orc roared loudly, and without wasting any time, charged straight at Bitcher with all its might. The orc's momentum was strong, but Bitcher remained firm and showed no signs of fear or nervousness. He swung his sword fast, cutting off the arm of the orc cleanly in one hit. From the cut-off arm, blood gushed out like a fountain and the audience was taken aback. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Without wasting a moment, Bichir moved swiftly like a hound, already preparing for another strike. With another swipe of his sword, he cut off one foot of the orc. The orc, now without an arm and a foot, stumbled forward and fell, bleeding profusely from both wounds. It emitted a surprise sound as though it couldn't believe what was happening. Bichir wondered if the orc was surprised by bleeding for the first time. Since he used Hellhound's Hemorrhage, a unique skill from a B-plus ranked demonic beast, the unique skill of Dot the Orc, Rapid Regeneration would not have activated because it was just a C-rank skill. The people in the audience were shocked out of their wits. They couldn't believe an 8-year-old did all that without using any mana. All the while, Hugo had a serious expression on his face and kept observing everything silently. Bitcher saw this and realized that Hugo wanted him to show him what he had learned in the library. Bitcher thrust out his sword and poured his energy in. A flowing liquid red aura materialized around the blade, shocking everyone present. Hugo and John were both left speechless at the sight. The orc who was struggling to get up did not even have any time to react. Bitcher moved swiftly like a hound, obliterating the torso of the orc with his aura sword. Hugo gripped the armrest on his chair tightly and stiffened at the destructiveness of the blow. John adjusted his glasses and congratulated Hugo because the genius of this generation had appeared. He appraised that what Bitcher showed was a low-rank sword expert's aura. John continued saying that even amongst all the clans of the Empire, there will never be a genius like this. However, before he could complete his sentence, he was interrupted by Hugo. Hugo said that the orc looked a little odd. The specialty of orcs is their incredible regeneration. However, the orc on the stage had not stopped bleeding. He said that Hugo only won because the orc had been weakened a lot due to staying in captivity. John, standing behind Hugo, resisted the urge to shake his head and could only lament in his head that Hugo cannot be honest with himself and simply be happy. The two's conversation was interrupted by the shout of Bichir in the area, who called Hugo, and asked whether there were any monsters that were stronger than the orc. Bichir's question created an unrest among the gathered spectators, causing murmurs and whispers to spread around. Bichir wanted to reveal a significant amount of his strength. 
If he was lucky, his achievements will be recognized and he would not have a chance to separate from Hugo. He could, for example, be dispatched into the wild or enroll in the academy. Bichir's request surprised Hugo for a moment, but he soon smiled. He said that it looked like the orc from faraway lands couldn't satisfy his son's hunger. He said that Bichir was at an age where he needed to continue to experience real combat. Hugo addressed John, asking him about the individual from the barbarian subjugation they had captured to experiment on some time ago. John said after a moment of contemplating, that indeed they had one such monster. It was very likely to be highly sensitive since it hadn't been fed in some time. Hugo ordered him to bring it to the arena. As the monster appeared, the spectators were shocked and nervous, while Bichir himself only looked at it with amusement. It was a troll, many times bigger than Bichir and absolutely massive in size. It growled in a deep voice. Bichir asked if he could start right away, to which Hugo agreed. The chains binding the troll crashed into the ground with a large sound, freeing the troll. Much like the orc, the troll also charged at Bichir straight away without wasting any time. Bichir also charged ahead, and jumped up, dodging a fist that sent dirt and dust flying into the air. Moving through the air, he came behind the head of the troll, and was about to attack when he clicked his tongue and jumped to a little distance from the troll, without initiating an attack. The spectators wondered why Bichir didn't take advantage of the opening and did nothing. But Hugo understood the reason and praised Bitcher's decision to not engage. The troll's regenerative ability was outstanding. So if one can't inflict a fatal injury in one go, they would only be wasting their energy. That was why a good strategy was required when one was hunting a troll. The fight continued on, with the troll delivering heavy attacks, but none of those attacks landed their intended target. Bitcher kept dancing around the battlefield, narrowly dodging each and every punch being thrown at him by the troll. Some of the spectators wondered if he was trying to tire the troll, while some argued whether an eight-year-old could make such a judgment. They felt it was what a true genius was really like. Bitcher, on the battlefield, was not having any trouble dealing with the troll's relentless attacks since the attacks were really slow, but he kept making a show out of it, always dodging them narrowly enough to avoid any injuries. He would be able to easily kill something of this level if he were to reveal his true strength but that would complicate things. He needed to kill it as naturally as possible. A good method to do so was to use the troll's massive strength against it when it came in for an attack. The moment he saw an opening, Bitcher utilized the momentum of the oncoming troll and put a deep cut on the troll's shoulder. The troll grabbed its shoulder and knelt on the ground, screaming in pain. Even though the troll received a significant wound, it would just recover right away from anything that doesn't kill it instantly. The people deemed that the troll couldn't be killed by the first fang of the Baskerville swordsmanship. But even then, they were all impressed by Bichir, who was only eight in appearance, and his performance. In fact, Bichir also knew it was impossible to cut through the troll's thick hide with only the first fang. If he used Beelzebub's hemorrhage ability, the troll would just die by waiting around a bit. But that would be meaningless. Hugo, seeing that the fight was in a stalemate, told Bichir to stop for now, as it could get dangerous if the fight continued. However, Bitcher insisted on continuing the fight. He said that he was on the verge of realizing something if he fought for just a little longer. He said that if he could not finish the fight in the next hit, he would stop it. After giving it some thought, Hugo agreed to let him continue. Enraged after receiving a wound, even though it was already healed, the troll roared loudly in anger and charged at Bitcher. How much power did Bitcher wanted to show? He had already thought of the answer to this question. He wanted to set up a scenario where it looked like he received enlightenment during combat and gained awareness of the next level. Bitcher concentrated and created a dark red aura around his sword. In the face of the charging troll, he remained steadfast, holding his sword firmly. The instincts of the troll kicked in at this point, as its rage-filled expression morphed into one full of doubt and shock. Through a vortex of swirling red aura, Bitcher moved at a speed unlike before and aimed at the neck of the troll. The red aura on his sword formed an arc and cut off the head of the troll, killing it. Within the Baskerville swordsman clan of blood and iron, a person's life was based upon a simple formula. Around age 15 was when one could imbue mana into a sword and exude an aura. At that point, most hunting dogs learned the first fang of Baskerville swordsmanship. But for the first time in Baskerville history, the second fang that his brothers would reach at the age of 18 was achieved by an eight-year-old. An irregular was born. Bitcher laughed awkwardly and said that he ended up winning. All the while, the spectators, John and Hugo the most, were all shocked beyond their beliefs and were left speechless at the sight before them. 
they couldn't believe what they just witnessed with their eyes. One week later, in the mess hall, Bichir sat eating his food and couldn't help but complain that no matter how much of it he ate, he couldn't get used to the random meat stew that was served here. Bichir noticed that no one sat around him, and whenever he looked at anyone, they would nervously turn around and run with their tail between their legs. They were all keeping distance from Bichir since the day at the arena. Bichir thought it was only natural in Baskerville, a place where strength was everything. Thinking of that day, he could not forget the sight of Hugo's shocked face and was delighted. The power he had revealed to the public was Baskerville's second fang and the strength of a medium-ranked sword expert. His true strength, however, was a weaker version of Baskerville swordsmanship fifth fang and the approximate strength of a low-ranked graduate. If one included the troll's unique skill ultra regeneration that was C+, it would be fair to assume that he was stronger than a regular graduate. Whilst Bitcher was thinking how his appetite has grown since getting Beelzebub, someone called him out. When he looked, he found the three siblings, Hybro, Midbro, and Lobro. He was instantly alarmed, wondering what these three were up to. He asked whether he needed to beat them up again to teach them a lesson. One of the siblings stepped forwards and told him that they weren't here for trouble. They just wanted to say that the way Bitcher hunted Cerberus and the troll was very cool. Listening to this, Bitcher almost spat out everything in his mouth. Seeing him like this, the three brothers looked concerned and asked if he was okay. Bitcher could not tell if they were trying to trick him or trying to play both sides. In any case, getting goosebumps wasn't a good feeling. He started having thoughts about wanting to pinch them. While he was busy thinking such thoughts, he was startled by John appearing behind him without him noticing. John adjusted his glasses and delivered the message he was supposed to deliver, asking Bitcher to go visit the clan head as quickly as possible. A luxurious carriage moved into the castle of the Baskerville clan, wielding the flag of the Moore clan. Inside a room, Hugo sat facing the Moore clan's clan head's agent, Adolf Mork. Both of them shared pleasantries and started discussing various things. Adolf said that he hoped that this year's annual event would end without much issue. Hugo replied that the joint training went without a hitch so it should be fine. Adolf asked that weren't there some severely injured people from both clans last year that could be counted as an issue. A vein popped in Hugo's head as he replied that the children of Moore clan must be very dramatic, calling mere scratches as severe injuries. Hearing the mockery, Adolf also popped a vein in annoyance. He said that it was because the Moore clan was prestigious and classy. A weird tension built up in the room between the two parties. One side was the prestigious magic clan, the Moore clan. On the other side, the swordsman clan of blood and iron, the Baskerville clan. These two clans didn't always clash from the beginning. The Emperor, two generations prior said that magic and swords are complementary existences. Just from these words, the Baskerville and the Moor clans began to proceed with joint training. Only the children between the ages 8 and 15 were to attend, and the clan's annual event began with a very good atmosphere. However, at one point, a conflict emerged. In the territory between the Baskervilles and the Morgs, a ruby mine ownership issue had arisen and so the relationship between the two clan heads was skewed. But because of the Emperor's orders, the joint training had to continue. Therefore, someone who was not the Mork clan head, his younger brother Adolf, began to visit the Baskervilles as his agent. Adolf decided to change the topic, saying that he had heard a rising star had appeared among the Baskervilles. A genius who might appear once in a hundred years from the Baskerville clan is a great fortune to the Empire. Hugo smiled listening to the compliment, and said that he didn't need to tout so highly about it. It caught Adolf off guard. He was surprised and found it unusual that a lizard-like bastard would actually react to compliments of his child. Adolf didn't harp on it, and said that great fortune had come on both sides. The Morg clan also had a genius appear. He then called for Camus to come in and give greetings. The door opened, and a young girl entered with slow and steady steps. As she sat next to Adolf, he introduced her to Hugo as the daughter of his elder sister, the clan head Raspane. Her name was Camus. Adolf told Camus to greet the clan head, but what she did surprised everyone in the room. She called Hugo a thief who had stolen their ruby mine and demanded that he returned it to her. Hugo was enraged at being called a thief. All the while, Adolf started panicking, reprimanding Camus. However, Camus said that they were his own words. In the carriage about one hour and 42 minutes ago, Adolf had said that the pathetic bearded man stole their ruby mine like a thief. Hugo grinded his teeth, hearing the words of the little girl. Adolf tried to defuse the situation, saying that there was some sort of misunderstanding. Hugo just shook his head, deciding to let go of the matter. 
He said what would a young kid know and that Adolf didn't need to give excuses about the Moore clan's education policy to him. However, as though completely oblivious to everything that happened, Camus shouted at Hugo again, asking him to return the rubies, because she could not even conduct her research because they were lacking in rubies. Hugo couldn't control himself anymore, but as the Empire's sword saint, he couldn't do anything to a loudmouthed child. At that moment, the door opened, and a young voice interrupted, saying that the Moore clan didn't teach their children not to covet what belongs to others. The one who had opened the door and entered was Bichir, and right behind him was John. Adolf looked at the young man entering, and wondered if that was the rising genius of the Baskerville clan. While he was thinking, Camus had disappeared from his side and moved in front of Bichir, asking him what he just said about her clean with her arms crossed. Camus kept shouting, but Bichir didn't pay it any mind. Bichir recognized her name, and he couldn't believe that it was the Moore clan steel-blooded empress as a child in front of him. Even among the innumerable archmages that originated from the prestigious magic clan, she was someone that was called the genius of all geniuses. During her heyday, she subjugated all the monsters and the barbarians of the Mount La Rouge at Lenoir herself, and the way she skewered and burned them all to form the imperial border's ash and blood became famous. Not to mention, her beautiful appearance which enraptured the socialite world was enough to manipulate the Imperials such that she was called the Avatar of Authority. However, that was a story from far into the future. At this time, she was just an eight-year-old youngster. Bitcher said that she must have worked hard, traveling all the way here just to throw a tantrum. Camus, hearing that was enraged, Mana swirled around her hands as her hair fluttered. She said that she would teach Bitcher why the ruby mine belonged to the morgues, in a simple way that their dog shit brain could understand. Bitcher thought that it looked fun. A bright light appeared and an intricate model made of ice was created within seconds. She said she would explain to him why the mine belonged to the morgues using the model. Bitcher was a little let down, as he thought they were going to fight. Camus pointed at the borders between the morgues and the Baskervilles, also known as the joint security area where the mine with high quality rubies originate. The problem was that the mine's entrance was located in the Moore clan's territory on the surface, while the underground mine is located in the Baskerville territory. Camus argued that the mine was structured in a way that the Baskervilles could not mine out the rubies on their own. That meant the ruby mine belonged to the Moore clan. However, the Baskervilles were forcefully insisting that the morgues were trespassing on their territory and interfering with their mining activities. Not only that, Baskerville had even rejected their offer to pay lease for the relevant territory. Adolf commented that his niece had a way with words. Bichir, who had heard the whole explanation, said that the mineral called ruby is indeed often used as a magical ingredient, and there isn't a need for the Baskervilles to use the rubies that are mined. However, a lease of territory was not in the picture. He said that the morgue's biggest tragedy is that no one in the Baskerville clan is idiotic enough to lease out their territory just to earn chump change. This time, it was Hugo that looked pleased, and Adolf looked nervous. Camus was shocked, but Bitcher continued and told her that they only cared about their territory, so the morgues shouldn't enter. After all, the only ones upset about not having the rubies were the morgues. Camus said that she would show it in an even more obvious way why the rights to the rubies belonged to the morgues. She pointed at both castles and pointed out their own lands. She then stretched her arm from her territory into the Baskerville's territory and asked who this arm belonged to now. Bitcher made sure that she was asking whose arm it was when passed into his territory. He grabbed her arm and said that obviously it was his now. Camus was flustered and squirmed, trying to get her arm free but Bitcher was holding strong. She said that Bitcher was silly for saying that she was his. However, Bitcher refuted her, saying that he never said that she was his. Camus was confused. Without any hesitation, Bitcher reached for the knife on his back and unsheathed it. Both John and Adolf were shocked, while Hugo couldn't believe what he was seeing. Bitcher brought up the knife and said that her arm was now his, as if intending to separate it from her body. Camus, who was both confused and terrified, was at a loss for words. Just as Bitcher was about to cut her hand, Camus shouted aloud, asking for her uncle to help her. Adolf also couldn't see it continue just like this and interjected. He released terrifying pressure, warning Bitcher to step away from Camus. Bitcher let go of her hand and Camus ran to her uncle, hugged her uncle and started crying. Adolf demanded answers from Hugo, asking him what was the meaning of this. Hugo turned to Bitcher and told him that his joke went a little too far. Bitcher apologized to Adolf and said that such jokes are normal between us brothers in the clan. He showed that the knife was just a fake by wiggling it around. Adolf was surprised, unable to comprehend why there was even a toy like that. 
Bichir bowed in front of him and apologized again. But Adolf still was not letting go of his anger. Hugo interrupted their conversation, addressing Adolf and said that he was being too overbearing for a joke between children. Asolf's own words were spun around and now directed at him, and he couldn't refute them, diffusing the situation even further. Hugo told him that he had already thought of something on his side for the ruby mine situation, something that the Moore clan would like very much. Tamis, with tears in her eyes, warned Bichir and said that she would never forget this. Bichir only replied in response. Time passed and the friendly competition between the Baskerville clan and the Moore clan began. Children, aged 8 to 15, gather in one spot to test each other's skill. Compared to the 8-year-olds who compete on mana sensitivity, or theory, the practical spars between the 15-year-olds receive a lot more attention. However, this year, the attention was directed elsewhere. The match between the prestigious Magic Clan, Morg Clan's Camus Morg, and the Swordsman Clan of Blood and Iron, Baskerville Clan's Bitcher Van Baskerville. Following the Morg Clan's proposal, it was decided to have a spar between the two rising stars of the two clans. The bell rang, signaling the start of the duel. Camus warned Bitcher that she wouldn't go easy on him and started chanting. Four magic circles appeared simultaneously around her, each circle representing a different element. The onlookers were surprised that an eight-year-old could do quadra casting of spells that even 15-year-olds struggled with. Hearing the praises of the crowd, Adolf had a smirk appear on his face. Camus released three different attacks at the same time, ice, fire, and thunder. However, they proved to be futile as Bitcher evaded them all with ease. Bitcher said that instead of flashy attacks, it would be better for Camus to focus on each spell individually. Camus HM fed, saying that Bitcher knew nothing about magic. She then cast the fourth spell, Sand Wall, causing a wall of mud to appear between both of them. One again, Bitcher broke down the Sand Wall with ease, shocking Camus. She wondered if it was the power of the Baskerville clan's river sticks. As Hugo closed the distance between them, Camus closed her eyes, bracing for impact, but the blow she had expected didn't come. Just when she opened her eyes, she saw Bitcher's smiling face and his stretched out hand. Bitcher flicked her forehead hard, sending her to the ground. Camus grabbed her head and asked Bitcher angrily whether he was going easy on her. Bitcher pointed at his forehead and said that her forehead looked like it was still hurting. He offered to end the battle early with his victory before it ended up worse. However, Camus refused to give up. She cast the sand wall double spell, creating two barriers between herself and Bitcher. Laughing out loud, Camus challenged Bitcher that he couldn't break through the barriers this time. Hearing her confident tone, Bitcher couldn't help but be at a loss of words. Wouldn't all of it be pointless if he just walked around the wall? In the end, Bitcher decided to play along. He used his hand and punched through the two sand walls, creating a big hole in them. With his arm past the walls, Bitcher asked Camus who the hand that had broken through the wall belonged to now. Camus was confused by the sudden question. Bitcher didn't give her much time to think, and answered that it belonged to whoever was the strongest. He delivered another forehead flick, causing Camus to fall back down with tears welling up in her eyes from the pain. The difference in level was clear, but instead of giving up, Camus attacked with flames, declaring she was going to kill Bitcher. Bitcher dodged her continuous attacks and wondered what he should do with her. If he really wanted to kill her, he could do it in the blink of an eye, but doing that would cause a huge uproar. In these sort of situations, the best and cleanest way to deal with things was by using someone else. Bitcher looked at the duel ongoing behind him. One of them was a stupid magician overusing fire magic and the other was an idiot swordsman cutting magic willy-nilly. Bitcher thought he could take advantage of the situation. Seeing Bitcher dodge every attack of hers, Camus charged at him, shouting for him to stop running away and fight her. Bitcher noticed the fire magician behind him preparing a big spell and realized that it was his chance. He retreated back towards the expanding cloud of fire and warned Camus to prepare a protection spell with a smile. Camus was shocked and caught off guard as the fire exploded, covering both Bitcher and Camus. After the explosion, the smoke and dust lingered in the air, disrupting all vision. The knights of the Morg clan were worried whether something had happened to Camus. Adolf, also worried for the safety of his niece, shouted her name in a panic. Inside the smoke, Camus heard the shout of her uncle and wondered what she should do. She had managed to block the damage with a protection spell, but the fire magic burnt all of her clothes, leaving her in nothing but rags. The smoke was covering her so no one could see her, but if the smoke faded, people would see her and she'd be definitely humiliated. Camus hugged her arms with tears at the corner of her eyes, wishing that someone would save her. 
It was then she felt something land on her head and looked up. She saw a shirtless Bichir, who had given his own shirt to her, telling her to wear it. Camus asked Bichir why he was helping his enemy, but instead of replying, he only said to give it back if she didn't want it. Camus grabbed the shirt and covered herself, saying that Bichir was now shirtless. But he didn't care about something like that. Camus couldn't understand Bichir. She wondered why he was being so nice to her. Bichir noticed the small wound on his arm, wondering if the idiot knight's sword fragment still had some aura left on it and stabbed him during the explosion. A scratch on a body strengthened by river sticks couldn't be made by a normal blade. As the dust and smoke settled, the visibility returned, and everyone could see the duo now. Confirming that Camus was alright, Adolf heaved a sigh of relief. The instructors watching the match couldn't tell who had won between the two and discussed among them. They then praised Bitcher's well-built body, saying that it was the culmination of the blessing of River Styx and his diligent training. They said it was an incredible amount of talent for an eight-year-old. Adolf went and hugged Kamu, worrying about her safety while she kept looking at Bichir with a curious gaze. Inside the castle, Bichir and Hugo were walking together. Hugo asked Bichir about his duel against the young daughter of the Mork clan. Bichir said that it was enjoyable and he was able to understand the true meaning of the event once again. Hugo said that a duel against a magician is very different compared to a swordsman, and was a worthwhile experience. He then asked Bichir why he didn't make a proper attack. Bitcher said that he hesitated a little as he had never fought a girl before. Hugo advised Bitcher that hesitation and battle led to injuries. He wanted for Bitcher to take the wound he had received as a lesson. Bitcher was surprised at Hugo's words, wondering whether Hugo was really worrying for him or not. He didn't really remember what Hugo was like during his childhood before his regression. However, the Hugo he did know was always strict, cold, and brutal. There was a rumor that the reason for his personality becoming vicious was because he lost his first wife, an eldest daughter in a bitter way. However, Bitcher couldn't confirm it. Hugo didn't harp on the subject and asked Bitcher's opinion on the issue related to the ruby mine. Bitcher said the best course of action was to just give the mine to the morgues. When Hugo asked his reasoning for thinking so, he replied that the task of the Baskerville clan was to develop the wilds and widen the border. The Red Fang Mountain, where the ruby vein flows, is downstream from Mount La Rouge at Lenoir. The demonic creatures and barbarian clans there were their problems. If they utilized the Moor clan well, they would be able to minimize the damage for the development. Hugo praised Bichir, and said that it was the correct answer. After obtaining the rights to the ruby mine, Moor clan would station a considerable number of personnel at the site. They just needed it, to steer the demonic creatures and barbarians to that side. That way, they would be able to deal with all the troublesome things in one place. With a crooked smile, he continued, saying that the ruby will redden even more by the blood of the morgues. When that happened, even the clan head of the morgues would regret setting foot in the Baskerville territory. Hugo said that Bitcher's strategy matched 90% of his plan. Bitcher couldn't help but feel awkward. After all, it was the plan formed by Hugo in the first place. Before his regression, he was the one tasked with dragging the demonic creatures and barbarians towards the morgues. Bitcher mentioned that they also needed to be careful about the morgues and monitor them. But Hugo told him not to worry about it. The number of hunting dogs Baskerville had sent to infiltrate them had steadily increased. As they were walking, they stumbled upon Adolf and Camus who still wore her torn clothes. She half hid behind Adolf, peeking from the side. Adolf addressed Hugo and asked if they could have a conversation before he returned. Inside the same room as before, Hugo sat facing Adolf and Camus. Bitcher stood on the side of Hugo. Hugo asked Adolf what he wanted to discuss, who said that there was just one important matter to discuss. Adolf said that the Moore clan has also contemplated thoroughly as to how to resolve the ruby mine problem as amicably as possible. The territory rent was just one of the many items on the agenda. Hugo asked what other terms they were going to offer, and Adolf replied, proposing a betrothal. He proposed to link the morgue and Baskerville clans through a boy and a girl. Upon being asked by Hugo who he had in mind, Adolf said, how about the eldest son of Baskerville, and the eldest daughter of Morks? Camus was confused and caught off guard, not expecting herself to become part of the conversation like this. Adolf began talking about how from her looks to intelligence, Camus had no lacking abilities. He said that he was sure she would be a great partner for the successor of the Baskerville clan, who was called the Small Son. Hugo said that the age difference was quite large as his eldest son was 25. Adolf said that the age difference was only 17 years and that it was manageable. 
Resolving herself, Camus interrupted her uncle and said that she would not marry someone who was weaker than her mother. Adolf tried to explain to her that if she kept thinking like this, she wouldn't be able to marry for the rest of her life. Camus just shook her head, saying that she was looking at their potential, and she also hated having a big age gap. She wanted someone of her age or younger. Hugo told her firmly that it was not a buffet, but she didn't back down and said that she didn't eat whatever was served to her. After a moment of silence, Camus blushed and looked in the direction of Bichir. Without her saying a word, everyone present understood what that gaze meant. Adolf was surprised and whispered in Camus' ear about how she couldn't do that since Bichir was not a full blood. He was an illegitimate half-son. He said that a half-breed dragon is still only a half-breed. Hugo, who had exceptional hearing, naturally heard the whispers, which enraged him. To him, talent was the sole criteria for judging, not blood. Hugo said that the opinion of the involved party was more important in the betrothal, and asked Bichir what he thought about it. Camus turned to look at Bichir nervously. Her heart was beating loudly. Bichir remained silent for a moment, contemplating his choices. After a while, he agreed, saying that he would do it if he was ordered to. Both Adolf and Kamu were surprised, but their interpretations of his words were vastly different. Adolf was enraged, thinking that he was being insolent against the only daughter of direct lineage of the Mork clan. While Camus was blushing from ear to ear, thinking that Bichir doesn't not like her, she thought he was the secretly shy type. Before Adolf could do anything, Hugo calmed him down, saying that direct and side lineage had no meaning in the Baskerville clan. Sometimes, Lo would produce inferior children, while Ken would produce superior children. To have the clan head speak so highly of him, Adolf wondered if Bichir was really that talented. Adolf Morg, a sixth circle master, he was an extremely strong man in the upper echelons of the Morg clan, a prestigious and elite magic clan. He was also known as a stupidly doting uncle to his niece. The idea of the arranged marriage came from within the clan and was not his. In fact, he did not even find the legitimate children of Baskerville enough for Camus. Adolf said that he wanted to have a duel with Bichir to see his talent for himself. He said that Bichir was someone who could become the husband of his niece one day, and that he was asking this favor not as the Moore clan's representative but rather as a girl's uncle. Hugo agreed to his request, saying that if he insisted on it, he could do it. In the empty training grounds, Bichir and Adolf prepared to duel, standing in front of each other. The only spectators were Hugo and Camus, who stood on the side. Adolf asked Bichir to show everything he had, however Bichir thought that if he really did that, then Adolf might faint. Adolf used fire and earth magic and created a jar, filling it with water. He then put the jar full of water on his head and said that he would give himself Bichir a handicap. He said that he would duel with a jar full of water on his head. If Bichir managed to make him spill even a single drop, it would be his victory. Bichir didn't say anything. He thought that Adolf Morg was a strong man he couldn't even hope to approach prior to his regression. This was a great opportunity to experience a portion of his powers. He was sure that Hugo allowed it, thinking the same thing. Adolf told him to come at him, and Bichir got into position. There was no need for him to give it his all. He just needed to show enough to make Hugo content. Bichir charged straight at Adolf and swung his sword. However, it was blocked by a magic barrier, doing no damage at all. Shield magic was the best response against a swordsman. Adolf told Bichir, who had backed up, that the shield would be hard to pierce without an exceptional aura. He then cast magic, creating multiple projectiles at once. The magic projectiles launched at Bichir with exceptional speed. Bichir stepped back even further and dodged all the projectiles. Camus scolded Adolf from the side, saying that he was using too much power. Adolf couldn't be sure whose side she was on right now. Hugo, who had been watching everything in silence, noticed that Adolf was attacking at a speed that was barely dodgeable. It seemed like he didn't need to intervene. In the arena, Bichir's thoughts were running wild. If he were to use the fact that he was an eight-year-old regressor, coupled with his pre-regression experience, he could bait Adolf into letting his guard down. He might even be able to kill him like that. Bichir advanced again and swung his sword at the magic barrier. It did no damage, but instead of getting disheartened, he kept going. Finally, with an overhead strike, a large crack appeared on the magic barrier. Adolf was surprised, realizing that Bichir had been attacking the same spot over and over again like a precisely calibrated machine. His focus and swordsmanship definitely deserve recognition. However, Bichir's sword also had cracks all over it. As Bichir slashed at the barrier, the sword finally gave up, shattering into multiple pieces. Adolf had a smirk on his face, saying that it was no different than trying to break a stone with an egg. 
He said that Bichir had talent, but it was nowhere near enough to be betrothed to his niece. However, before his words could finish, he felt a stream of water dripping down on his head and stopped. His head was practically drenched now. A fragment of the sword had actually broken through the jar. Bitcher asked Adolf if that was enough or did he need to spill more out of the jar. On the sidelines, Camus was completely shocked. Her face getting redder and redder, she said that she couldn't believe Bitcher won against her uncle, even though it was just a coincidence. Did that mean the two of them were going to get married? Hugo, who had watched the entire duel, smiled as he thought how could the broken piece of the sword just happen to conveniently hit the jar. He didn't believe in such coincidences. Bitcher Van Baskerville. Hugo thought that the hunting dog he was raising might be much more sly than he originally thought. Thanks for watching. Keep your eyes peeled for the next chapters as Bitcher turns 15. Follow his adventures and witness his growth in a world full of surprises. Stay tuned for more of Bitcher's thrilling story.